This conference will now be recorded. Ooh, that was official sounding. It is. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome. Um, we are thrilled that you're all here. And I will just turn it right over to Mark to get started to talk about World War One. Yes, World War One, in particular, uh, for those of us who live in Iowa, uh, we like to think of wintertime as a time where everything is frigid, terrible, and awful, and there's nothing but gray outside and things like that. Well, there was something very similar that happened during World War I. Uh, and no, it's not every winter during World War I. If you say that, that's not true, even though it's totally true. But uh, today we're gonna to be talking about uh, the AEF uh, in Russia. But uh, more specifically, we're gonna be talking about uh, what was really going on in Russia kind of throughout the war and then towards the end of the war and uh, why the war didn't necessarily just end on uh, 11 November 1918. So uh, we're going to graze through some of this stuff. Again, it's really kind of a whirlwind and there's a lot of pieces that have to be put together. Uh, I've got a book recommendation that I'm going to make at the end of the presentation. Uh, just because I think it's extremely important. It's a text that covers it much more in depth than I ever possibly could. So I'll have that. Uh, if this decides to move. Ooh, so you have to click it. Click into and it. And then you can move it. Over. Aha. You know, technical stuff. Um, but real quick though, uh, arsenal information, just because we, we are getting asked this a lot right now. Um, so you can now come on to post if you have a visitor's pass, uh, and we want you to come on to post if you have a visitor's pass, or even if you don't have a visitor's pass, go get one. Uh, they're free. They're good for a year. Uh, visitor control center is giving those out. Uh, we also have the, uh, the tours that you can get. Uh, those tours are still mostly good, except now there's a few bits and pieces on there that are out of date. Uh, they will continue to be a little bit more out of date as we barrel towards our 160th anniversary of Rock Island Arsenal coming up next year. Rock Island Arsenal Museum remains closed for renovations. I don't work for the museum, guys. I'm sorry. can't tell you more information beyond the fact that it's closed for renovations, but they will be open again here sometime soon. But that's enough of the admin stuff, so let's get to it. Um, First slide here, uh, I'm one of those people, I like a timeline. Uh, I think enough of you have seen these presentations enough to know how much I love my timelines, but this one is the messiest timeline I've ever made because World War I is a mess. Uh, however, most of what we're gonna be talking about tonight is gonna be centered in between 1917 and 1925, right in that time frame. And some of you are saying to yourself, but Mark, the war ended in 1918. I know, but it didn't. Uh, so we're, we're going to be going a little bit further here, but some key things here to list out uh, are 3 March uh, the, in 2018, 20, I almost said, good Lord, 1918, uh, the Treaty of Brest uh, Litovsk. My Russian is great, guys. Uh, then we jump into 1919. Uh, the AEF is still in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, the, the Bolsheviks will take Omsk in, on 14 November, and uh, it just kind of keeps piling on. But it's going to start way back in 1917, actually in February, uh, during the February revolutions in the Soviet Union. So we, we have to start further back. Uh, really to kind of understand. And really, we have to start back even further than that, as all things World War I, it's a tangled web, and there's no way to do it very quickly and acutely. So let's start, actually, back in 1905. Um, as uh, Vladimir Lenin describes uh, the great dress reversal. So these are one of the first uh, bits of revolution that we see in the Soviet Union. Uh, it takes place uh, during this time, but there's four problems that are kind of outlined by uh, Sidney Harkave. Uh, Harkave is an American historian that specializes in Russian uh, revolutionary history, uh, and he defines them thusly. 
Uh, newly emancipated peasants earn too little and couldn't sell their land. So they're getting land, but they can't do anything with it. They can't transform it. They can't plant ag. Uh, and they can't sell it. And they can't get mortgages to even pay them. Uh, in addition, minorities were marginalized by their government. So if you are a minority, you had no representation at all. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Uh, working class was not allowed to unionize, and they had little in wages, so there were no unions allowed. Um, there wasn't any kind of organization or structure to how any of the uh, the wage structure was actually laid out uh, in the workers, and the wages were struggling to uh, keep ends meet. Uh, and then lastly, you have university students uh, being exposed to radical ideology in very lax university and classroom environments. Um, so, and most of these are not necessarily coming out of Russia proper. These aren't necessarily Russian universities, um, but these are some very um, non-practice ideology that is being taught in a classroom and preached as gospel uh, is what I kind of uh, tie this into. So. To summarize that, the TLDR, for those of you who are hip and cool and can recognize uh, abbreviations like that, uh, the issues are agrarian, nationalism, education, and labor are the four key points that Russia is having issues with. Um, just a massive amount of uh, turmoil that's coming up and then rising to the top. And then we have things that uh, come about, such as Bloody Sunday. Uh, which uh, there were plenty of protesters that were uh, injured uh, and the protests turned rather violent. And when I say rather violent, it turned very violent. Uh, but that's an example of some of this. And it even gets to the point where you see barricades in the streets of Moscow and Petrograd and things like that. So there's a lot of unrest that's going on in the Soviet Union, or excuse me, in Russia at the time. We're not the Soviet Union just yet. So at the same time, there's all these small sects of uh, resistance that are breaking out all across Russia. So you have the Tsar, who is still ruler premier over all of Russia at the time, but there's challenges to his power that are kind of showing up everywhere during this time. And those will continue to fragment as we get into 1914, 15, 16, finally coming to a head in 17, but continuing well after 1917 into the 1920s and even the early 1930s. Uh, it goes as far as to mutinies taking place aboard flagged Russian vessels, including military vessels. Uh, so you'll see redirection of war material as well as redirection of ag supplies, uh, manufacturing goods, and just raw production material. The strikes that were taking place in the workers' unions that were technically illegal, uh, generally grip manufacturing plants, quarries, refineries, and small businesses. So you were seeing businesses all over the place boarded up. Uh, and then the protests occupied many city squares, including Petrograd, uh, as it says there. And uh, as mentioned with Bloody Sunday, uh, most of those uh, 200 demonstrators were uh, probably engaging in some form of combat with uh, Royal Guard at the time. Uh, during the two years of protests, there's about 1,500, or excuse me, 15,000 demonstrators that were killed during the two years of unrest. Again, 200 during the initial day on Sunday. 3,600 national soldiers were also killed during the time. So it was, this is internal turmoil, but it's nothing like we'll see coming around the time where you get into the uh, later Soviet Union, especially during uh, the Stalin years. So the, and this slide isn't really named the best considering the fact that we just got through talking about an earlier revolution, but this is really the one that stuck. Uh, so the February or March revolution. So why do they call it the February revolution? Well, it's because it uses the old style calendar. So when we're looking at things, and especially around this time, we'll see some things that are like a month or so ahead or um, earlier than what they actually were. So in our calendar today, it'd be 8 to 16 March. In the old calendar, it would have been 18, 19, 20, and 21 February, right around in that time frame through about 3 March. Um, 
So we have a growing unrest amongst the Russian, Russian population, mostly in the bazaar. Things are terrible. Now, in addition to all these problems that we had before, because none of them were resolved, we are also dealing with less in the way of food supplies because we're having to ration out all of our foods. All of our fellow countrymen are being killed for a war that we have really no idea why we're fighting other than the fact that we're in a agreement with other allied nations. Uh, so all this is kind of bubbling to a point. The Tsar's power had already been drastically reduced over the last 50 years. You could probably even stem it back a little bit further than that, but most of us will draw that conclusion around the uh, Franco-Prussian War kind of time frame. Uh, if I had one of my work buddies here, he would say that the answer is always the Franco-Prussian War. He's kind of he's kind of right. Um, so the initial protesting uh, was generally in Petrograd, which is modern day St. Petersburg. There are smaller demonstrations elsewhere around the country. Um, but the mass organized protests begin on 8 March, uh, such as this one down here at uh, Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg. This is one of the larger protests. Um, however, Violence does finally break out with these protests, as large protests are wont to do, uh, and you'll start seeing gunfire exchanges as early as 10 March, uh, such as what you see above. But what's really kind of strange, and what's always really been kind of bizarre in my mind about how things go with the Russian revolutions is that there's no clean cut guideline. Uh, so by and large, um, especially in lieu of some recent events that we've had, you generally have police and government versus people. Uh, however, that wasn't really the case here. It was police versus police versus military versus military versus people versus uh, the Tsardom backed military. And there were all these different weird weaves and factions that were running out through it. So you really, it was kind of, it's kind of mind boggling to me to figure out how exactly people are identifying their friend and their foe here because they all look exactly the same as everybody else. They could be anyone. Um, so, but this is a good example up here. So there's a couple of students laying out here in front of a, uh, an actual soldier, a Russian soldier. Uh, and that Russian soldier is providing covering fire uh, for the students. So it's a very strange kind of dynamic that we have here during this time. And it's not something that you really, you really think of when you're thinking of a coordinated conflict. And indeed, the revolutions generally aren't, but this is just a little bit too much. Um, by 12 March, the forces in that garrison uh, that were actually aligning uh, originally with the Tsar will actually switch and they will actually uh, begin to aid the resistance. And the Tsar will abs actually abdicate and flee uh, a few days later, which will leave a power vacuum in his place. It's about 1,400 people that are going to uh, die in an internal civil war that's going to happen in Petrograd in of itself. This is not to be confused with the Russian civil war. This is in the city of Petrograd. Um, but eventually, they'll get a provisional government. It's established right around 20 March, and the Entente powers will actually recognize that provisional government almost immediately. Uh, I think 22 March is the last, the latest date that it, uh, that there's any kind of recognition. So I'm sorry, uh, Yvonne, but I had to cut off the top of your head here in the bottom picture, I'm sorry. It's actually a really nice painting. The art historian in me is uh, wanting to now uh, analyze that, but on, on topic, on topic. So, 7 November 1917. We we all we all here probably know the phrase Red October. Uh, and when we're talking Red October, we're largely talking about this date. Again, old style October 23, I believe. Um, but uh, largely 6 7 November is are the two dates that we're looking at. Uh, revolutionaries are going to utilize weaknesses of the provisional government. So when I said there's a power vacuum, just because they created a provisional government that doesn't mean that they have uh, anything set in stone over there. There's still a power vacuum. There's not one guy that's got everything under control. It's just, hey, we're still a nation, but we don't know who's leading us right now. So can you guys come back in like a half an hour or something? You know, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. 
So the underestimate continued beyond June um, because, again, there's nobody leading, there's nobody making changes, and all the problems are still there. Nobody's fixing the problems because there's nobody there to fix the problems. Uh, lights are on, nobody's home. Best way I can put it. On uh, 6 November, uh, Trotsky is actually going to vote for a military insurrection and uprising in Petrograd. And on 7 November, there is a mass occupation of Red Army forces in government buildings. Uh, and this is the day that most historians will go out and say this is when the Soviet Union is the Soviet uh, after this date. Uh, and finally, by 8 November, the Winter Palace in Petrograd is occupied, and that's pretty much where we'll say that, draw that line for the first domino. We talk about the domino theory a lot when we get into the Cold War, especially when talking about Vietnam. Uh, but if you want to really trace back where the first domino is, it's this date right here, 8 November. Um, what happens with this kind of, well, the provisional government uh, knows that there's going to be a revolution. They just want to stave off some time. Uh, and the Allies want them to stave off time, too, because they know as soon as the Bolsheviks get involved, Russia's going to be out of the war because the Bolsheviks are running on the idea that they don't want to be involved with the war at all. So that's a loss of the entire Eastern Front if the Bolshevik, Bolsheviks get the power. So the provisional government is actually going to silence newspapers and all media outlets in order to attempt to stave off any kind of resistance or any kind of organized resistance by uh, by the revolutionists. Uh, it's not going to work. Um, the armed uprising itself, that was largely Lenin's uh, idea. So uh, Lenin had made the decision at the time that there was no way that we were going that he was going to achieve his goals and objectives through peace, through delegation, uh, or anything of the sort. So his idea is just to go in and just kick him out. So finally, we've lost the Winter Palace, 8 November, 20, I said about 21 March, right in there was when we got the last provisional government. So now we have a new provisional government, uh, 8 November. And then, but at this point, all these other little fragments that I was mentioning earlier decide that they now see an opportunity to get a piece of the pie, to make themselves either independent or to make Russia their Russia. Uh, and some of them are going to succeed and some of them aren't. However, unfortunately, we get an armed civil war. The thing that's so different about the Russian civil war is that we have, we have, I, I, I have a problem with this too. We have a problem when we think of the term civil war that it's an internal struggle between two opposing parties. There's like 50 opposing parties in the Russian civil war. Uh, and not all, almost none of them like each other. Uh, so it's basically, well, I'm going to have to go against you and then eventually I'm going to have to annex all of your material to go after the next guy. And think of feudal states Japan. It's very much the same, except it's with a little bit more modern weapons. So let's start it with the treaty, end it with the treaty. So we have our fancy schmancy timelines here. This is me with trying to do my cool stuff that I do with animations. Starts triple on time, 1907. Uh, one of the causes of World War I, those entangled webs, webs of treaties. I don't think I have to make an argument about that at all. I think we all know by this point that treaties are probably what uh, started World War I in the way that it started. Um, but among those treaties was the Triple Entente between France, Britain, and Russia. There were mutual security acts in place, which that could be a presentation all in of itself. But if we look back into 1912, Russia is in a state of internal struggle. Uh, the abridged initiation of Russian involvement in World War I is that Triple Entente alliance. Uh, so that's what will bring them into the war. By the time we get to 1914, uh, the Eastern Front opens on 17 August, and uh, it quickly crescendos into a massively bloody war, especially by the time we get to the Battle of Tannenberg, which is in September. And then uh, Galicia is under Russian control by the end of 1914, so they actually had to go in and annex a large portion of Eastern Europe just to drive the uh, Austria and Hungary 
uh, forces out of the region. And that's where that culminates. Uh, by 1950, or 1915, excuse me, Russia was the primary threat to the Central Powers. It wasn't the Americans, it wasn't the British, it wasn't the, Fran the French. I mean, they didn't do things right in France, but uh, they could handle themselves. Uh, so the Germans are focusing largely on the East because they're aware of just this massive amount of power that Russia can actually throw at them. Um, and the war will eventually uh, turn into the Russians' favor by about the end of 1915. Um, after about that, then they pretty much got the Germans focusing on a two-front battle a little bit more. They know that they can't not focus on the Western Front. They know that they have to focus on both. They'll largely leave the Austria-Hungary forces to deal with the Eastern Front um, and reduce the amount of German forces there. 1916, uh, this is one of them that I, well, I might have actually left a slide in there, but there's, we really get the crux of Russian activity in World War I. So we have the Brusilov Offensive, uh, which is the largest offensive on the Eastern Front. Uh, I think we've talked about that in a previous presentation as well, but uh, the abridged version of that is it is the largest offensive on the Eastern Front, and it's the last large offensive that the Russians are going to be involved in. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't quite succeed. It achieves what the Allies want the offensive to do, which is to reduce the amount of strain on Verdun, uh, but it the Russians don't get their objectives, their own objectives. The Allies get their objectives. Russia does not get its own objectives. Uh, however, uh, around this time, Romania is going to enter the war alongside of the Russians. Uh, so it seems like things are still working in the Allies' favor at this point. Uh, but by the time 1917 rolls around, uh, Eastern operations are generally by the Romanian army because Russia does not have a good control of the situation with their domestic issues. Um, that they, they're pretty much taken out by the time uh, the October Revolution comes around. So much, in fact, that by the end of 1917, Soviet Union signs a ceasefire with the Germans. Um, but as we all know, the Americans are going to enter the war in April of 1917 which will thankfully kind of fill that hole that is created by the Soviet Union. It's not quite the same. They're not a continental power. Uh, they're going to have to, of course, make their way over from North America, and they're going to have to deal with the U-boat war. Uh, but they have the material and manpower to kind of throw in where um, the, the Soviets have been knocked out. So Russian involvement ends on 3 March. Uh, that is the official day that they end all hostilities. They close the Eastern Front, um, and that's largely pushed by that inner turmoil. But uh, at the same time, roughly roughly about three or four months after uh, the uh, Soviets and the Germans enter that ceasefire, the Allied forces are actually going to launch the campaign that we're going to talk about here in just a minute into Siberia and Archangel. So I'm going to kind of rush past some of these because really what we what we want to get at is uh, the AEF component. But uh, just to kind of give you guys an idea, um, this is pretty much the slide on the Russian Civil War. So um, there were over half a dozen alliances. So there were alliances with their own factions underneath them. Uh, but amongst the alliances were uh, separatist groups, which we'll look at here on the next slide. So Poland, Finland, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, there were a few others that were mixed in there. Um, and the Czech Legion were all different uh, sects that were in there. The Allies still were recognizing the Russian Republic. What I want to emphasize, though, is that we think of the wolfhounds and polar bears uh, situation or the uh, Russian army in terms of a white army versus red army. Well, no, it wasn't a white army versus red army. And indeed, what we more closely aligned with was the Russian green army, uh, which was the anti-Bolshevik left green army. Uh, but we were also very interested in making sure that the Czech Legion, which was the white army, was withdrawn as well. Now, 
But it's important to remember the white army didn't necessarily appreciate that. Uh, however, there were generally no contacts uh, with the Green Army, despite the fact that we were technically aiding them in an indirect way. Uh, but there was also a Black Army that was involved there, too. So there was green, black, white, red. I've, there's probably a few other colors in there if I really wanted to throw it out there, but uh, those were the big ones. Uh, but the greatest concern to the Allies was that there was no more Eastern Front. Um, we can talk all day about them wanting to take man and material out of Russia, and yes, that was a concern, but the real concern here was for the fact to get the Eastern Front going again. Uh, there were even multiple documents and uh, official citation that actually say that the president wants this front open. Uh, so we're, we're, while we can see this being a thing of, well, they're wanting to come in, they're wanting to, you know, establish stability and things like that. That's really not what's going on here. This is, this is about getting that front open back up again. Um, so, and this is largely not even really pushed at though by the U.S. The, Individuals who are most interested in getting that front open again are the British and the French. Uh, and the British and the French are going to send a lot more soldiers than we will. Of course, there's also one power that sends more than all of us put together. We'll talk about that here towards the end, uh, because I, I will I will never shy away from uh, from from my thoughts and uh, stance on that whole thing. But we'll we'll move on here. Uh, so the uh, Soviets and the Germans are going to sign the Treaty of Brest. Litovsk on 3 March 1918. Uh, that is uh, an actual uh, headline from a German newspaper there uh, that says peace with Ukraine. Um, so pretty much, I mean, after 15 December 1917, the, the Germans are, there's not, and there's not really much in the way of engagement going on between those two forces. Uh, it's one of those things where literally the word comes down, hey, ceasefire, and everyone's just like, yep, okay. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't instances where we see uh, some minor skirmishes break out. I mean, we, of course, had some issues on the last day of the war uh, after the armistice is signed, but this is very much the same. They're, they're, they're just done. Uh, peace talks began a week after the ceasefire was agreed to. Uh, but there were two key things that the Bolsheviks wanted out of this treaty, and but, but they didn't want it from the Germans. What they wanted is from the Allies. Uh, so in, in Lenin's mind and in the Bolsheviks' mind, the Ger Bolshevik delegation, their mindset is, hey, uh, we want to be the example. We want to be the example. So uh, we want... Uh, either uh, the Allies to see this and say, hey, you know what, you're right, this is done, let's stop, or they want to be the example for uh, the conspirators that they have on the Western Front to sabotage the Western Front. Uh, and indeed, we do see instances, especially in the French army, of uh, communist and Bolshevik sympathizers trying to sabotage points in the Western Front. Uh, those aren't successful. Of course, however, uh, it, it goes to show just how far they really wanted to drive that the war needed to end. Whether or not that's necessarily a, what's the word that I'm looking for, a benevolent approach to the situation is a matter for debate. I would argue that it is absolutely not. Uh, but that is their mindset. You know, hey, if they don't stop, make them stop. How do you do it? Stage a revolt. So, so war material in Russia. I, as much as I said that it wasn't primarily for um, the recovery of war material, I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't at all, because indeed there was plenty of material that was in Russia. There was plenty of it that we needed to withdraw. So, um, the greatest concern was largely that Czech Legion that had a large amount of 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 war material that either was of great interest to the Americans or had even been provided in some instances by the Americans. Um, 
But the primary risk was that there's all this stuff. And what if it falls into the Germans' hands? Or what if it falls into the communists' hands? Uh, we really don't want that to happen. Uh, so the idea is we're going to send in forces in order to extract this material. Um, and if we can, we'll get the people out too. But we really just want that stuff out of there because, you know, the people can figure out a way to escape. Air quotes, because I know those of you who are watching at home can't see me with my air quotes up here. <laughs> um, but assets had built up across Russia due to German activities in the Pacific as well. So we have assets that are on the, uh, the western border of uh, Russia to deal with the Germans in Europe. But we also have material on the eastern portion of the country to deal with German activity in the Pacific, even though German activity in the Pacific had largely been dried up because Japan pretty much chased them out of there in 1914. Uh, however, again, I would argue that the bulk of that material was provided by Britain or France. Uh, so supplies for the Eastern Front were largely in the port city of Arkhangelsk. Uh, supplies for the Pacific Theater were largely at Vladivostok. Uh, in addition, uh, I would also say that there was a large stockpile probably in Omsk uh, and Murmansk. So there, there were a couple of locations there that uh, that were key. But uh, I hope it's on. No, oh, it's on one of these other slides. We'll get to that. What you'll notice about most of those cities, though, is they're either port cities or they're cities that are situated on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Uh, so we'll take a look at that here in just a second. So the Western powers are slow or silent on the Bolshevik takeover. So what do I mean by that? Well, they weren't really keen on the Bolsheviks. Um, we, we, of course, know what comes uh, years later. After this, we get the rise of Soviet Red Communism. Uh, communism had already begun to take uh, the, the world at that point. So you have communists that are sprouting up in Germany and France. Uh, China already has the beginning of its uh, Communist Revolutionary Party uh, and other locations across the globe already. And we're really starting to see this kind of clash between West and East with this. Uh, so it wasn't really that much of a surprise when you think about um, just what uh, what a Bolshevik revolution really kind of meant here. And this is an actual newspaper clipping here. Uh, extremist rise to power in Russia. Uh, this is actually, if I'm remembering right, from the New York Times. Uh, but yes, from outset of revolution, they have thwarted efforts of moderate governments. Uh, supreme, supported premier only when the uh, Kornilov movement failed them with apprehension. Uh, so the key takeaway here, though, is that simply the West saw this as a viable and reasonable threat, with fair reason, um, I would add. So, good forward. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but the, the key thing here, again, though, is that the Bolshevik platform is to withdraw. The, and the allies just don't want this. This is a matter of, well, we can deal with this other issue later. It's very much like it was in World War II. We can deal with the issue of, of your communist background later, but right now what we really need you to do is go in and start exploding things for us again because we've got a war to fight here. Um, so that's really what it comes to with, uh, with with how the Allies are going to view uh, the Bolshevik takeover here. By the way, this is the most fantastic picture I could find. So this is a volunteer guard of a steel plant in Petrograd. So uh, a lot of plants had their own individual red guard. And um, a couple of these guys have really fantastic mustaches. I'm looking at this one dude over here on the left, and then there's a Another dude that's like three over the right. These are just some of the most gnarly mustaches ever. Uh, but yeah, that was the volunteer red card uh, for a steel plant in Petrograd, 1917. This is going to be a quick slide just because uh, it's it was something that I was going to have an illustration with, but I decided to just write it out. So this is the, all the hands of the pot. So we think about, uh, you know, World War I is basically World War I, but World War I continues in 
of the Russian Civil War. So we have the entirety of the central powers that are going to be involved in uh, in the Russian Civil War, all the Allied powers, uh, the separatists, of which most of them are going to actually, the separatists are, will be the ones that will come away from this pretty much mostly, mostly okay. I say that loosely because we know what happens later, but they will come away mostly okay. Um, but we'll see the White Guard up here, so the White Army, Russian Army, South Russia, and the Don Republic uh, wrapped up in there also too is going to be your um, Czech Legion. Allied powers, Czechoslovakia is going to be factored into that. And then of course there's the anti-Bolshevik Black Army, Green Army, uh, Russian Republic, and then again, uh, additional communist states there uh, that are supporting the Bolshevik uh, revolution up there up top. So the Chinese communists, Mongolian communists, and the Ukrainian uh, Soviet states. So tangled web. Here is one of the uh, fantastic uh, maps to kind of kick us off as we actually start talking about the ADF. Everybody out there is just like, we've been talking now for 40 minutes and he hasn't mentioned anything about the AEF. Well, he got there. Uh, so this article that's actually clipped out here, uh, we actually pulled out of our archives. So this is out of the Rock Island Argus. Uh, that is from September of 1918, talking about uh, General Graves heading up from the Philippines uh, to um, the uh, to Vladivostok, port of Vladivostok. So he's going to run up there with about 5,000 soldiers. Uh, and their initial step off date is in August. The order comes in in July. Step off date is in August. Uh, he's going to take the 27th and 31st Infantry Regiments, the Wolf's Hound and the Polar Bears, as they are going to be uh, respectively known, uh, as well as uh, Supplementary Reserve Forces out of California. Uh, so that would be your two yellow arrows there. Graves is going to depart from the Philippines, that's the red arrow, uh, as most of the, um, the elements of the 27th and 31st are going to come. Uh, from the Philippines as well. And their whole thing is they're going to secure the eastern quarter thereabout of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Now, I have a green arrow here. I didn't really describe it on the slide, but it's there because those are additional allied forces. Uh, those are forces that are coming in from Japan uh, up through uh, Manchuria, and those forces are going to be there for a long, long time. Um, they, they will not be leaving for quite some time. Uh, but the primary focus here is going to be sending these forces up uh, to try and take Vladivostok, secure Vladivostok as a uh, port of entry and departure, and then secure portions of the Trans-Siberian Railway on the eastern portion of the uh, nation of Russia. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, the bulk of operations in Russia were conducted from mid-1918 through 1920. No, war ends on 11 November 1918. Uh, the North Russia Expedition Campaign runs through 5 August 1919. The Siberian Campaign runs through 1 April 1920. So when, our, when the uh, soldiers finally come home from any combat deployed mission is going to be 1 April 1920. Uh, this does not include occupation. Uh, occupation, I believe, withdrawals in 1921. Uh, but I could be I could be off of my dates there. Somebody's probably going to correct me on that, and that's okay. You can correct me on that because I'm not an expert on the occupation times. Um, but there were problems. What are the key problems? Well, the key problems are problems with movement. Uh, horses weren't used to the frigid tundra. <laughs> I've lived in Iowa for 32 years. I ain't used to the frigid tundra. Um, transportation hubs weren't secured, so these, what you're seeing down here is a list of all of the key transportation hubs and all the child railways associated with the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Um, all the way down next to way, way, way down in the right corner where this uh, red line ends, that's Vladivostok. Um, and then Arc Anglesk is up to the north and um, North and west of a uh, Yaroslavy up there, so uh, quite a quite an amount of distance and quite an amount of uh, uh, challenge involved with securing points between A and B when you have a vast wilderness between you and uh, 
your destination. So we, we do kind of call this uh, American involvement in it. So what was the American involvement or rather the allied involvement in the Russian Civil War? Disruption. Um, it was disruption without necessary intention. Uh, so American and other allied involvement largely restricted uh, the extradition or was largely restricted to the extradition of the Czech Legion. Um, Extra, uh, extraction of war material, as previously mentioned, but despite these key objectives, didn't stop the Americans from coming into small skirmishes with the Red Army. Um, I think there's about yeah 200 uh, casualties, as mentioned there. And of those 200, I think there's about 64 come off of actual skirmishes with the Red Army. Uh, the rest of them are all coming off of Spanish flu or exposure or things like that. Um, but the largest detachment was in uh, Siberia, and that was attached to Japan. It was not attached to the Americans. Uh, and the Americans also didn't openly ally themselves with the White Army, which often resulted in that heightened tension, as I said, bad foe identification and occasional skirmishes. So some of those skirmishes might not even been with the Red Army. They might have actually been with the White Army, not understanding the intentions of the American forces coming in. Um, but this, this is an actual picture of all the uh, Allied commanders in Siberia in 1918, and it is indeed wide and varied. By and large, it's mostly just graves for the Americans. The rest of them are all the Japanese, French, British. Um, it's really not a large uh, detachment of American forces that have made their way into Siberia, at least. Uh, and it really won't be a large one that goes into Archangel either. Uh, but still, they are there. Uh, this is an example here, the, the American soldiers marching into Vladivostok, uh, as you see up there. And I, I should point to mind, when they were in cities, generally by and large, the people were not all that hostile towards the Americans, that, because the Americans generally left the people alone. Uh, they weren't interested in, you know, doing anything in particular. They were there for a mission, which is get our stuff and get out. Uh, so generally, you don't see a lot of instances where um, there's innocent civilians that are being killed by Americans here, which is saying something considering the fact that the enemy probably looks like a civilian. And we see how much of a disaster that becomes when we get into later wars and conflicts, i.e. Vietnam uh, and eras like that. So Archangel uh, is our other fantastic uh, place to be, which is, looks, I've looked at pictures of it. It looks beautiful and I'm sure it is, but it's not frigid. Um, but a smaller contingent is gonna go up here. Um, it's going to be largely composed of the 339th Infantry and the 310th Engineers are going to make their way up here. Uh, the British are going to land first at Murmansk uh, before they will eventually join the Americans Art, at Art Anglesk. Uh, and they'll actually break out from Art Anglesk a little bit more than the Americans will break out in their Siberian campaign. Um, the Allies will break out a little bit more up this direction, mainly because the concentration of Red Army forces in this region is much more dense and the risk of the mission is much higher uh, over on the inhabited side of the country, which will be over on our western side. However, uh, when I say that we have the 339th Infantry Regiment and the 310th Engineers, that is all that we have up there, along with about 3,000 uh, French and British forces combined. The Red Army has the entire 6th and 7th Red Army deployed in the region. Uh, however, they are deployed in Russia Civil War era Russia. They are, they have to share bullets, they have to share guns, they have to share pretty much everything. They are very poorly equipped, but here's what they do have. They have knowledge of terrain and they have a home field advantage. Uh, so that will give the Red Army just enough of a one-up uh, to generally push any allies back uh, that come into their uh, into their territory. But again, the skirmishes with the Americans were not all that dense. Um, we're not talking about these World War I numbers when we're talking about AEF in Russia. Uh, we're talking tens 
uh, versus some of these other battles where we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of casualties. We're talking tens. And of the hundreds that we, we actually lost, most of them are coming from Spanish flu. We're in COVID era now. We can all understand how bad an issue like Spanish flu could be. But here's where it comes into play and where the withdrawals have to come from. Uh, the American military was perfectly ready to continue operations in a very limited capacity. They were aware they weren't not going to meet all their operational objectives. They set off without the intent to ever fill and meet all their operational objectives. They wanted to get as much done as they could. Here's our bucket list. Let's prioritize. Uh, we can't have everything, so let's get the important things first. But American families are still broken because of these deployments. So they're expecting these soldiers home after the signing of the armistice on 11 November 1919, and they're saying, hey, where, where's Bob, where's Dale, where's Joe? Where are all these people? They're not home yet. And then, you know, unfortunately, one or two of them is getting, hey, Bob or Joe is dead. Well, where did he die and when did he die? He died, you know, June 19th, 1919 in Russia. Why the hell are we in Russia? Um, so our outrage gets sparked by this because the war is over to the American public. The war is over. The American public did not want to go into war. The American public did not want to stay into war. And as soon as they read the headlines that the war was over, the war was over. That was it. Um, so by and large, the immediate pullback uh, largely came from the American uh, public and the outrage. Uh, but the key things are these four points at the bottom, and I actually am going to read these verbatim. So the engagements and involvement in the Russian Civil War, soured relations with the Soviet Union and the Allies through the interwar era. That is true. It continued well after that, too, as we well know. Uh, tensions remained high with Japan due to their ongoing occupations and previous conflicts during the Russo-Japanese War. We're going to talk about that here in, on the next slide. By 1 April 1920, all American forces had withdrawn from Russia, having little or nothing to show for their presence, and the campaign remains accepted as unconclusive or an objective failure. Um, I would side more with the unconclusive, just on the grounds of there was a fair amount of personnel and material extracted. Whether or not that was it met the threshold of what was a mission failure or not, or it pushed above that, I don't know because I don't know what that mission plan looked like. I've never been able to find a mission plan for uh, any of the Russian campaigns, but I would venture to gather it was probably more on that lines of it's really kind of blurred. Uh, we, we didn't get much of anything out of it, but we didn't. We might have gotten a little bit more out of it than we lost. It's really hard when you're talking about, uh, you know, loss of life, though, uh, to, to make those calls, uh, especially when you're talking about a few figures versus uh, material or an unknown number of extractions. So it's, it's really hard to do that because as a historian, uh, and we've talked about this before, when you're talking about tens of thousands, a, Casualty rate of 10 does not seem that high. Yeah, but you have to justify them in some way. You can justify the large battles, but if, you're, if it's just 10 for something that might not be tangible, it gets harder uh, to justify those things. So I, I don't want you guys going away from here thinking that, oh, well, he, he, he's, he's doing in, inequities with you know, how, how he's assessing this. No. I recognize that. That's why I'm just like, I'm undecided of what I think if it was a failure or a mission accomplished. But Imperial Japan overstays. Uh, whenever it comes to Imperial Japan, I will take every opportunity to talk about Imperial Japan and just how bad they were. Um, so Japan joins the Allied intervention in Siberia at the end of World War I. Um, their forces outnumbered all of the other allies combined. So of all the forces that the Allies sent to both uh, campaigns, the Japanese will send more than both of those combined into Siberia. Uh, they'll send over 60,000 Japanese forces with just for over 3,000 casualties. They'll withdraw 
1925, but it's not really a true withdrawal because they're mostly hanging out on the ports, um, mostly just kind of lining with Manchuria there too. And this is big because it would take us into World War II because these are the pieces of the puzzle that will actually start what I would always argue is the beginning of World War II in 1931. Uh, when the Japanese launch their invasion full into Manchuria and start annexing parts of mainland Asia. Uh, so that's where this begins. Japanese don't begin their withdrawal from Siberia uh, until 1922. Uh, but again, 60,000 forces, they were there for an extended stay. They were there for with intent for occupation. Um, so Japan kind of starts showing its true colors here. Uh, and this is actually a slide that we pull out of our Pearl Harbor slide because of uh, this reason. Uh, they've, they've established themselves as a potential threat that they might have ulterior motives. So that comes out of the, uh, the Siberian campaign as well. So with that, folks, that does it for this presentation. Oh, I promised you guys a book recommendation as well here. I did see somebody head to bail. That's okay. We just wrapped up. Uh, but for those of you who are still with us and those of you uh, who are watching um, uh, your on-demand, your fancy schmancy YouTubes, interweb, whatever we have going on out here, I have a recommendation here for you here. It's called Wolfhounds and Polar Bears, the American Expeditionary Force in Siberia. 1918 to 1920. Uh, it talks explicitly about the Siberian campaign. Doesn't really go in much with uh, Ark Inglesk, but it does talk Siberia. It's by Colonel John M. House. It was put out in 2016. Uh, this is one of the most comprehensive write-ups that I've seen on the Siberian expedition. And if anybody had questions, and I guarantee you, I know somebody's out there that would probably ask this, but if anybody had questions that I couldn't answer and there's Pretty much all of them are that. Uh, this book would probably answer it on the site here. So. Well, thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, we are thrilled with this presentation. We are actually going to, I'm going to stop recording. So anyone who wants to speak up and share your questions, feel free to unmute yourself. I'm going to stop the recording.